Well, we've had quite a year, and this Thanksgiving is going to be very different for many of us than previous Thanksgivings. But I've got some ideas and recipes to share with you for how to create a delicious Thanksgiving meal on a little bit of a smaller scale. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary, and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferments, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, I think for many of us in the past cooking for Thanksgiving, we often made large turkeys and lots of sides in large proportions with lots of gravy and just a lot of food in general. But this year, many of us are entertaining, even if we are entertaining, a very small group of people. And often it may just be a few family members. And so what do we make? Well, something that I've always liked to do, even if I am having a larger group, is rather than roasting a large turkey, to instead roast two small turkeys. Or you could even scale that back and just roast one small turkey. Now you might be thinking, oh well, I don't even know if I need a whole turkey. But there are a couple of different things you can do. First of all, any extra meat you have, you can save in individually wrapped packages and put that into your freezer, and then you can pull that out and use that in different recipes. You can make like a turkey tetrazzini, you can make turkey soup. There are a lot of different things that you can do with leftover turkey meat. But if you say, no, I don't, and like I said, I'm not going to roast two small turkeys, let alone I'm not even going to roast one small turkey. If you want to just do a turkey breast, you can definitely do that. And if you want to do it really quickly, you can do it in the Instant Pot if you've got one of those. And I have videos for all of this. I have videos for how to roast small turkeys. I have videos on how to cook the uh, turkey breast in the Instant Pot and be successful and have it, taste, have it taste good. And all of the recipes that I'm going to talk about here today, I'll be sure to link in the description below. So just open the description under this video and you'll be able to link to all of them. And for where I have space, I'll be sure to put some in the iCards. And something nice about making a turkey breast in the Instant Pot is that it also makes a wonderful broth at the same time. Because you have to add some water into the Instant Pot uh, so that it doesn't burn and that everything cooks beautifully. In essence, it's almost like a high temp poaching. And then you have that wonderful, in essence, turkey bone broth that was made from, and I'm assuming you're buying the turkey breast on the bone, but you can also buy it off the bone. But if you've been with me for a while, you know that I always recommend whenever possible to buy your meat, whether it's chicken or turkey or beef and so on and so forth, uh, buy it with the bone in because in the long run you really get your money's worth because you can use those bones to make bone broth. But in any event, getting back to the Instant Pot, so if you've got your turkey breast and it's on the bone, you're going to have this lovely, flavorful, uh, in essence, bone broth or, or even just a, a turkey broth or a turkey bone broth that'll be in the bottom of the Instant Pot. And then you can use that turkey bone broth to go ahead and make your turkey gravy. And I've got recipes showing you how to do, make, making homemade gravy is very easy. And given that you're basically putting one to two cups of liquid into your Instant Pot with your turkey breast, that's a turkey breast on the bone, you have a smaller amount of turkey bone broth or turkey broth uh, that you then may, will be making a smaller amount of turkey gravy with. So it works out perfectly if maybe you're feeding about four people. Now you can do the same if you decide to roast a small turkey. And in the video where I roast two small turkeys together, uh, they're each somewhere between 10 to 12 pounds. So they're much smaller than a, a you know, a, one of those real big 20 pound plus turkeys that many of us will often roast uh, at Thanksgiving. But I found, you know, as I said, even when entertaining a lot, I find it easier and a little more manageable uh, to roast smaller turkeys. 
And you can do the same in many ways similar to what you would do with the turkey breast uh, in the Instant Pot. You can go ahead and put your turkeys, even say it's just your one 10 to 12 pound uh, turkey, your whole turkey, put that in your roasting pan on your rack, add some water, and then as the drippings start coming down off of your turkey, you're going to have a wonderful turkey broth there that then you can go ahead and use to make your turkey gravy. Now, if you do uh, the turkey breast, but you know, an on the bone turkey breast, you do have the turkey breast bone uh, left over when your meal is finished. And you can certainly save that in your freezer as a scrap and with whatever other little scraps you might have left over for when you want to make a bone broth. And it doesn't necessarily just need to be a turkey bone broth. You can use that turkey breast uh, bone uh, with a chicken carcass or even with your, your beef bones. Uh, but I would recommend saving that until you have a little more, uh, you know, a few more bones to add to it just using that turkey breast bone. However, if you decide to roast that smaller turkey, you've got a lot to work with. You've got the leg bones, the wing bones, the breast bones, and that can be used to go on to make a lovely turkey bone broth. And I've got recipes for how to make it. If you've got the Instant Pot, I'll show you how to make it in the Instant Pot or the slow cooker. There's a, you can even do turkey bone broth on the stovetop. Uh, it's very similar as just as if you were making a chicken bone broth. It's very easy. It really only needs, in terms of the slow cooker or the stovetop, it really only needs about a six hour simmer. You're not simmering it for days and days on end. Just about a six hour simmer and you should get a wonderful, beautiful, gelatinous turkey bone broth. But if you want to do put the bones into the Instant Pot, then it takes about two hours. It's very easy to do. So you do have some options, you know, the smaller just turkey breast, which not only can you do that in the Instant Pot, you can certainly also roast the turkey breast in the oven and or just doing a smaller turkey and then either way just making a smaller amount of gravy. And then you're all set to make your turkey bone broth, which you can then, once that's made, and literally, you know, as I've said with chicken bone broth, turkey bone broth is the same thing. You're literally making it from scraps, and it literally costs pennies a jar to make. And then you have this wonderful broth that you can use uh, in place of water when cooking rice and other grains, uh, for making soups and stews. It's just a wonderful, nutritious, gelatin-rich, which gelatin is very good for soothing our guts and also for our hair, our skin, our nails, everything. And so you have this wonderful, nutritious liquid that's basically cost you pennies to make. And so even if you're doing a small Thanksgiving, even if you're doing a small turkey or just a turkey breast, uh, you can still benefit uh, with being able to make bone broth as well. And generally you'll find when you go through my Thanksgiving recipes, many of them are geared to serving smaller amounts of food. Uh, generally, uh, they're geared to, to feeding a, a party of four to six people. So that can be very helpful. Uh, if you're feeding a smaller group and maybe you just want to have a small amount of leftovers, most of the recipes that I'm going to recommend are going to fit that category very well. One of those recipes is a cornbread dressing or cornbread stuffing, although you're not stuffing the turkey with it, uh, is a, it's a cornbread uh, dressing recipe uh, that I have, uh, you know, in a video and all of these, you know, will have the printable recipes with them. But the cornbread dressing is very nice because it's also a very traditional nutrient dense food because you're using a uh, whole grain, a recipe for cornbread that's made with whole grain flour. And, you know, I walk you through the steps and yes, if you want to use all purpose flour, if you're at the very beginning of your journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, and you've not started incorporating whole grain flours 
and whole sweeteners into your cooking, you can certainly use all-purpose flour. But if you're a little farther on your journey and you've started incorporating whole grains, I show you how to make this cornbread dressing using whole grain flour. And I make it right in a cast iron frying pan. So, you know, it's really just about enough to feed about four to six people. And speaking of nutrient-dense foods, I don't know about you, but for me, a Thanksgiving dinner isn't complete without some really good cranberry sauce. And coming up, and it should come up sometime after this video, hopefully this, uh, this Saturday, I've got a recipe for how to make fermented cranberry sauce. Now, if you've never fermented fruit, don't worry if you're watching this recipe and it's, or you're watching this video and it's very close to Thanksgiving, fruit ferments very fast. I literally made this in about 72 hours. So fruit ferments very quickly. And now I've got a wonderful fermented cranberry sauce uh, to serve. And the good thing about making fermented cranberry sauce is that because fruit ferments quickly, it also doesn't last a long time. So you want to make fermented fruits, whether cranberry sauce or other fermented fruits, in small amounts. And then you want to put them in your refrigerator. They really only last a few weeks. And when I say last only a few weeks, which you'll learn more about uh, in the video on fermented cranberry sauce, is because it can start to turn into alcohol. <laughs> so you'd have a boozy cranberry sauce. But the nice thing is you make it in small amounts. So if you're having only a few people for Thanksgiving dinner, this is a great option. Now, I also have a recipe for making a nice uh, traditional uh, cranberry sauce that you cook. And that's sort of an orange cranberry sauce. And it's very tasty. And I use a whole sweetener in that. Uh, I believe I sweeten it with sucanat. And either, and you can use sucanat, which is, it stands for sugar cane natural. It's uh, simply uh, dried sugar cane juice. So it's got all the vitamins and minerals in it. Uh, you can also use maple sugar, you can use coconut sugar, you can use date sugar. Any of those whole sweeteners work very well in that cranberry, in that cooked cranberry sauce that I share with you. And yes, if you're at the very beginning of your processed food, uh, <laughs> your journey from leaving a processed foods kitchen behind to moving to a traditional foods kitchen, you can use white sugar uh, to make that cranberry sauce. And the nice thing is at least you're making it homemade because a lot of the ones in the can at the grocery store, unfortunately, are made with high fructose corn syrup. And I know there are differences of opinions on high fructose corn syrup, but it's not something that I like to... Uh, incorporate into my kitchen and it's not something I think that when you talk about traditional foods I don't think it's something our grandmothers <laughs> were using. Uh, so making cranberry sauce homemade is a wonderful step in the right direction on your journey to a traditional foods kitchen. And if you've already started incorporating those whole sweeteners they work very well in this recipe. And if you're uh, family is transitioning with you as you're m introducing these foods uh, because the cranberries have such a strong tart flavor that this is a wonderful recipe for incorporating whole sweeteners because it's very difficult to notice that you've not used white sugar especially if you add other flavorings to your cranberry sauce as I do uh, in that particular recipe where I incorporate some orange juice, some orange zest, and some cinnamon, and so on and so forth. It makes it very flavorful. No one's going to know you used a whole sweetener that's rich in vitamins and minerals. And then, of course, to go along with your turkey, your stuffing, or your, or your dressing, your cranberry sauce, and your gravy, you've got to have some mashed potatoes. And I have a very simple recipe for how to make mashed potatoes. And this was the way my mother made them. And it's very easy and it's foolproof. So if you have made mashed potatoes and they come out clumpy or thick or this or that or never the way you hope they're going to come out, this is the perfect recipe. And I'll definitely, that, as I said, they'll all be in the description below. But all you need to do is have one of those little handheld electric beaters. 
And this recipe, I think this started becoming popularized, and you'll have to let me know in the comments below, depending on how old you are, if you remember this as a child, uh, like I do. Uh, but around maybe the late 1950s, early going into the 1960s, when mothers were starting to get a few more electric gadgets into their kitchen, uh, my mother got a, one of those electric handheld beaters. And she had for years had the old fashioned little egg beater that was just a manual one. And you could certainly use that if you've got one of those old fashioned ones, you can certainly use that to make these mashed potatoes. But she had one of those little handheld electric beaters. And I don't know if companies still do this or not, but back then, when these uh, new gadgets, so to speak, would be sold uh, to the public, they would often include a little recipe book with them. And I know those recipe books sometimes are kind of popular because I'll see them being sold on eBay. It's sort of a novelty now. But they would include in the box a little recipe book. And in the box was this recipe for making mashed potatoes using the electric beater. And my mother tried it, and she, I just remember her saying, I can't believe how light and fluffy these are. These are the best mashed potatoes I've ever made. And so I've been making mashed potatoes like that ever since. And again, you can scale these up or down depending on how many uh, people that you're having. And you'll see the recipe I have is not a huge amount. And you're just going to peel your potatoes. You're going to boil them up. You're going to have some salt and some butter. You're going to really give that a good whirl. Thin it, you know, with a little milk or cream, whatever you have on hand. And you're going to have luscious, light as cloud mashed potatoes. Put a little well. Put your little turkey gravy in there that you made from turkey bone broth. So it's so nice and nutritious. And you're all set. Now, no Thanksgiving, I think, can be complete without dessert. And that dessert is usually pumpkin pie. I think that it's the one time a year that many of us have pumpkin pie, and maybe just that one day. And I have a very easy recipe for how to make pumpkin pie with a no-roll crust. So you don't have to worry about making a pie crust that you have to roll out and then get into your pie pan. So if you're new to making pie, I think you're going to really love this. You basically bring your dough together and then you put it into your pan and then you just press it out with your hand. It couldn't be easier and it's so tasty and delicious. It comes out perfect every time. It's not going to be soggy. It's not going to be wet. It's going to be perfect and so easy to make. And then the pumpkin filling is very easy to make because you'll just have, you don't need to buy, you know, any like prepared pumpkin pie filling. You basically just need your pumpkin and you can either buy just pumpkin puree in the can or you can use pumpkin that you've cooked yourself from a pumpkin you may have on hand. And then whether you want to make your pie with evaporated milk or condensed milk, I have recipes to show you how to just take milk. Say you don't have evaporated milk in the can on hand. Say you don't have sweetened condensed milk in the can on hand. I show you how to make those it's just with milk. So if all you have is milk, you can still make them. You can't get to the grocery store. Don't worry about it. You can still make this pumpkin pie. You can take your milk and turn it into evaporated milk or turn it into sweetened condensed milk. And I show you how, and it's very easy to do. You'll never buy either of those again. And I just want to share a little bonus tip with you. If you like using poultry seasoning when you make your turkey or when you make your stuffing or dressing, I have a recipe where I try to do somewhat of a copycat version of Bell's poultry seasoning. If you're familiar with that little yellow box with the turkey on it, uh, that has a wonderful poultry seasoning, seasoning in it, which is great for using both in the cavity of your turkey or when you make your dressing, when you're cooking up your onions and your celery and you put in a little bit of that Bell's poultry seasoning, it's wonderful. Well, I made, that can sometimes be a little hard to find these days. And so I made a uh, sort of a copycat, it's not exact, 
but I think that you'll find that it's very delicious and it's so easy to throw together with a couple of herbs and spices that I'm confident you have in your cabinet. Well, if you have enjoyed learning about the types of recipes that I like to make for Thanksgiving and you want to learn more about these, be sure to click on this video here where I cover all the recipes I talked about uh, here today and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.